I am honored to introduce Jennifer Eberhardt. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you uh, all for inviting me. Um, I had too much time on my hands this morning, so I decided to uh, um, clean off my computer desktop, and I actually erased my talk. But, <laughs> 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 but I was able to get it together, I think, uh, again, so hopefully uh, we'll just see how this uh, goes. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, so first let me uh, present uh, two dominant views on race uh, and talk about where my work is situated. Um, so uh, one view on race is that race is absent. Um, for a long time now, we've known that most white Americans think about racial discrimination as a thing of the past. Um, so most believe that discrimination against blacks is no longer a problem. Most believe that blacks have equal employment, education, and housing opportunities. Most think that blacks are treated fairly. And most Americans generally claim that they never experience negative thoughts or emotions when they encounter people from different races. Now, according to the General Social Survey, only 17% of white Americans report being very concerned about racial issues. Only 7% consider race one of the nation's most important issues, and only 6% um, say that they think about race very often. From laboratory studies on college campuses, we know that white students uh, don't consider race to be central or important at all to their personal identities. Um, and the average white student claims very few friends across race lines. Uh, now, based on these data, uh, one could come away with the impression that um, race matters for very few white Americans, and for those for whom it does matter, it occupies them for a very uh, limited number of circumstances or for a very limited amount of time. Okay, so not only are white Americans inclined to think that they're racially unbiased, but they report that they're not inclined to think about race at all. Now, uh, my work is consistent with lots of other work in social psychology on racial bias, and it stands in stark contrast to this lay view on race. And the basic ideas are that uh, race can influence people more often than they think, um, that our attitudes and our beliefs about race can be processed implicitly. So in circumstances where we don't even know we're thinking about race, we could be thinking about race. And at times, these attitudes and beliefs about race can lead to negative consequences. Now, uh, for the purpose of today's talk, I'm going to um, focus on the racial associations that, uh, th uh, that involve African Americans. And um, the studies in part two all examine uh, the association of blacks with crime, and the studies in part two examine the association of blacks with animals. Um, and the argument here is that blacks are not only criminalized, uh, but they're also dehumanized in uh, ways that could lead to negative consequences in the criminal justice context. Okay, so first let's talk about the association of blacks with crime. Um, now, of course, there are dozens of things that keep this association strong, but I'm going to quickly uh, highlight three. Um, and the first is that the stereotype of uh, blacks as hostile or dangerous or criminal is one of the strongest stereotypes in, uh, of a blacks in American society. It shows up in study after study. And although not everyone actively endorses this stereotype, um, nearly everyone in our society has knowledge of its existence. Uh, second, uh, law enforcement practices underscore the relationship between race and crime. Uh, this is a cartoon that I borrowed uh, from The New Yorker, and uh, it shows these uh, two cops. They're stopping this black guy. They hold up the sketch, and they say, you look like this sketch of someone who's thinking about committing a crime. Now, this takes the use of race as a proxy for criminality to the point of absurdity, because that's what cartoons do. But using race um, as a proxy for criminality is routinely practiced in law enforcement communities, and it's perfectly legal as long as it's not the sole factor used. Third, um, actual crime statistics uh, contribute uh, to an association of race and crime. So this graph shows that uh, uh, black males are grossly overrepresented in prisons and in jails relative to their numbers in the population. Okay? And racial disparities like these have not escaped the popular press. Um, we hear these disparities reported over and over in news reports across the nation. Okay? So we have beliefs. 
We have practices and we have this intense racial stratification all working together to support and strengthen this association between race and crime. And I'm going to argue that this black crime association is so strong that it influences us in indirect and in unexpected ways despite our desire to be egalitarian. Now, all of the studies I'll present are uh, relevant to the criminal justice context, and I'm going to highlight their relevance as I move along. Um, many officer-involved shootings involve the detection of a weapon. Uh, so for the first study, my colleagues and I asked the question, can simple exposure to black faces lead people to see weapons better? Okay, so to examine this, we invited uh, male undergraduates, white male undergraduates, in uh, to participate in a study, and they were seated in front of a computer screen with a focus dot at the center, and they're just asked to stare at that focus dot, and then there are flashes of light that appear around that focus dot, and they're to tell us for each flash uh, really quickly um, whether that flash appeared on the left or the right of the computer screen, and they do that just with a button push. Okay, um, now, um, although the participants were seeing these uh, flashes of light, some of the flashes were actually the faces of young men that were being uh, flashed on the screen at such a rapid rate that they couldn't consciously detect them. Okay, so here it is in slow motion. So... Um, some of the participants were exposed to an entire series of white male faces in this way. Some were exposed to black male faces and then some to no faces at all, okay? Exposing people uh, to um, images that are beneath conscious awareness um, is called subliminal priming. It's a standard technique that we use uh, both in social psychology and in cognitive psychology. Um, now, after the subliminal priming procedure, we asked the participants to perform um, an unrelated, a supposedly unrelated um, object detection test. Task. And for this task, participants were presented with a series of objects that were severely degraded, okay? These objects appeared on the screen one at a time, and um, each was slowly brought into focus in a series of 41 steps, okay? So here's an example of this where there's an object that's completely degraded. I'm just showing you key points along the continuum here so that by the end you can clearly see what the object is. And the participant's goal this time is to indicate with a button push the moment at which they could recognize what that object was. Okay? Some of these objects were crime relevant like guns and knives and others were uh, crime irrelevant like staplers and cameras. Okay? So the participants were either exposed to the black male faces or the white male faces or no faces at all, and then all of them did this object detection task on both the crime-relevant and the crime-irrelevant objects. And we hypothesized that the participants who were exposed to the black male faces initially uh, would need less time to uh, detect the crime-relevant objects. So here um, are the results. Here along the vertical axis we have the frame number um, in the continuum at which they could recognize what that object was that goes from frame one where it's degraded to frame 41 where it's completely clear. And the first thing we'll notice um, is that for the crime irrelevant objects, it makes no difference whether they're exposed to the black faces or the white faces or no faces beforehand. They're recognizing those crime irrelevant objects at about the same point um, in the continuum. But you get a really different pattern when you look at what they do for the crime relevant objects. So you can see here that simple exposure to the black faces beforehand drastically reduces the perceptual threshold at which they could recognize what those objects were. Okay, so they need a lot less information uh, to say, oh, that's a gun or that's a knife. And when we expose them to the white faces beforehand, you get the opposite effect. They need a lot more information. They need more clarity before they're able to say to you, oh, that's a gun or that's a knife, okay? So exposure to the black faces facilitated uh, the detection of these crime objects, whereas exposure to the white faces inhibited the detection of those very same objects. Now, uh, the next set of studies I want to present have to do with the issue of racial profiling. Um, so um, the idea here is that uh, when people think black, they think crime. And so the first study I just presented demonstrates this. But we, uh, my colleagues and I wanted to argue um, that the association works in the opposite way as well. So when people think about crime, they think about black people, okay? Thinking about crime draws uh, attention to black Americans. Under these conditions, uh, black people are um, placed under surveillance. So I'm going to give you an example of this. This is another study my colleagues and I conducted with white male undergraduates. Um, 
This time, half of the participants were subliminally primed uh, with crime objects on the computer screen, and here it is in slow motion. Um, and um, next, the participants were asked to uh, complete a dot probe task, okay? And so for the dot probe task, uh, they were um, shown on a computer screen a black face and a white face simultaneously. This time, they were shown the faces long enough to be detected. Those faces came on the screen, and then they disappeared, and a dot appeared where one of the faces used to be, okay? And the participants' goal was to simply uh, locate that dot on the computer screen as quickly as possible. Tell us whether that dot was to the left or the right um, of the computer screen, okay? Um, and we hypothesized that when that dot was in the location of the black face, um, the participants who had been exposed to these crime objects beforehand would be faster at finding that dot than those who had not been exposed to those images. So the idea is that once we get people to think about crime, they'll begin to look at the black face, and we use the speed at which they could find this dot as a proxy for visual attention. The faster they are at finding that dot, the more likely it is that they're showing an attentional bias in that direction the whole time.